All right, today I'm going to tie a uh, old pattern from John Barr called a flashback tongue stone, um, and this is uh, this is a pretty darn good little stone pattern that's really not all that hard to tie, um, in uh, you know from the mind of John Barr, which you can't go wrong with. Um, I remember the the first time I saw this fly way back in the day, and uh, you know John has a very unique way of tying with the uh, the shellbacks that he uses and and uh, he dubs differently than most people as well and kind of ends up with a little fatter, shaggier body uh, than than maybe the example I have sitting in the vise right now. Um, when I was warming up, I tied one his way that's a little shaggier and uh, and juicier looking. But um, <clears throat> that's one of the things that, that very first impressed upon me when I saw John's flies, uh, you know, the flies that he actually tied, uh, were a little juicier. So um, I'll show you how to go about it. And... Uh, We'll, we'll twist up this uh, this tongue stone. So I'm going to start with a uh, TMCO 5262, and I'm going to tie you a size eight, nice big fat one uh, for the uh, for the camera. And we're going to put a, a five thirty seconds gold tungsten bead on here. We're going to tie golden stone. Obviously, you can tie this in in dark colors as well. Um, so I've got that that bead on there. Um, and now, just for the record, like as I slid that bead on, I can feel that back edge is real sharp. Um, I'm going to risk it. We'll see if I can't get away with it. <laughs> um, normally, if with a real sharp bead like that, I'd take that off and, and use a different bead. Um, but I think on this fly, just because of the, of the way we're going to have it set up, I think we can, we can uh, get away with it. So we'll, we'll see how my luck goes. So I'm going to take some uh, 20 thousandths lead wire, and I'm going to start it here just in front of the hook point and make about a dozen turns. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Uh, maybe 13. Then I'll break that front end off. I'll break that back end off. And I'm going to shove those lead wraps up into the back of the back of the bead there. And then I'll start in with my thread. My thread is just Danville, regular old school Danville, six dot in yellow. And I'll start this just behind the the lead wraps there. And I'm going to build a little thread dam. Uh, so really just a, a wedge of thread here against the, the back edge of the lead just to kind of step up and then I'll cross hatch up the lead and back down the shank again and at that point I can get rid of that tag end and run my thread all the way back to the bend of the hook. I want my thread hanging about even with the point on the barb, about like so. Um, Alright, so now we're going to use some biots for the tail and I've got some nice gold biots, gold goose biots, um, and I'll show you one little trick here. Um, I'm not going to build a nub. This is a big fly. Um, I'm not going to build a nub or uh, or dub anything here at the bin, but I am going to make just a little extra layer. I think that was four or five turns right there, just beyond the, the point on the barb, um, you're right at the bend of the hook. What that's going to do is going to help me separate these biots. Some biots have more curve than others, and... Uh, in warming up for this fly, I notice that these biots don't have they don't have a ton of curve. They've got some curve, but not a ton of curve. Um, but I'm going to take these two biots and I'm going to oh, not drop them. I'm going to oppose them so that they're curving away from each other. And frankly, this pair of biots has much more curve than the, the pair I previously used. Let me get those where you can see them. But they're curving away from each other. And I'm going to measure these maybe just short of half a shank. And I'm going to take these two biots, my thread's hanging at the front of that little, those little turns of thread, and I'm going to set these just slightly off toward me as I start to tighten the thread here, and usually I hold this in place, but I'll let you watch what happens. I'm going to tighten my thread and let those pop right up on top, and then come forward over them, tanker them in place, and I've got a nice little split biot tail. Um, so now I'll come, it really doesn't matter how far I come up here, I'll nip off those ends just short of the lead, and then just wrap over those. And we've got a nice split by a tail in place there. <clears throat> now I'm going to take a piece of 4X tippet material. And I like to use a fairly long piece just so I can get, get a hold of it later. But up here, just, just right at the back edge of the lead, I'm going to tie that in along the far side of the hook. And I'll let my thread kind of kind of roll it down on the far side of the hook. And then I'm going to take a piece of 
curl lateral scale. If I can get a hold of the dang thing. Here we go. Lateral scale has got a crinkle in it, so it's got a bit of texture to it. Um, this doesn't have to be lateral scale. This could be medium pearl tinsel. Um, I don't know that the lateral has has any magic to it, but um, you know, it could be uh, saltwater size flashaboo lateral scale. Any any variety of stuff that you might have on hand on your on your desk. Maybe I should tell you what I'm doing here. I'm going to tie this piece in just behind the lead. And I want to tie it in flat, and then I want to pull it out and undo those wraps, and I want to do it again uh, just for practice. And now, on the second try, I'll wrap all the way back over it to the bend. Make sure you don't tie that in flawlessly on the first try. That's that's for amateurs. Uh, try to get a little practice in on each fly if you can. All right, now I'm going to take a piece of golden stone thin skin, and you could use um, mottled oak in tan or just straight mottled oak. Um, this is golden stone color, which is a little more yellow. And I'm going to cut a strip. I've been having pretty good luck here cutting these, yeah. Cut a strip that's not quite, and hold them still here, not quite as wide as the gap of the hook. And I'm going to separate this off the off the paper backing. Like so. So I've just got this this slip. Um, now my camera battery is telling me that it wants to die. Um, so I'm going to tie this in real quick and then I'll pause for a second and we'll come back. So I'm going to move my thread up to the lead and I'm going to lay this thin skin down on top and let it buckle around the hook. And then I'm going to kind of stretch it as I go, and I'm going to wrap back tightly over it, letting it cup around the hook shank all the way back to the base of the tail. And you want to make sure that when you get back there that there's no thread showing in behind. All right. And now we're going to get to the dubbing part. So I'm going to pause here for a second, and I'm going to put a fresh battery in the camera, and I'll be right back. See, I don't really even have to tell you that. I'm just being honest with you, because we're friends. So be right back. And just like that, we've got a fresh battery in the camera. I'm super fast at that these days. All right, so now we're going to dub the abdomen. And uh, any variety of coarse dubbings will work here. I'm going to use some tan south scud dubbing. Um, and what I want to do here, um, you know, I feel like I feel like I've I've shown the the conventional dub technique plenty of times. I'm going to show you John Barr's a, tr a trick that John Barr showed me years ago. Um, and this is direct dubbing, and I've shown it on other videos, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that dubbing and just get it started on the thread. So I've just twisted, get that up there, just that front corner on, and then I'm going to hold the clump and I'm going to start wrapping that. And as you do that, you can see the clump of dubbing starts to twist around the thread, and depending on how closely I hold it, will control how much dubbing goes on the thread at a time. So I'm going to ideally start that dubbing right back here at the bend. And then I'm going to work forward, and you can see I'll just bump my fingers back as I go. Getting a little heavy there, I'll feed out a little bit of thread. Kind of draw that dubbing out. And as I wrap, that dubbing is just twisting around the thread. But what it, what this does is builds a big body that's kind of shaggy and loose very quickly. Okay? Now, you could absolutely put that on. That's what I did on, on this guy that I showed at the beginning. Put that on, on in the conventional manner, but this is going to be a little more uh, uh, true to John Barr's style. Uh, so now, I'm going to take this thin skin and pull it up over the top, and I want to stretch it a little bit as I come over, drape my thread over it, and then pull toward me and let that buckle around. And I'll get that tied down with several turns. So that's buckled around the top of the fly. Then I'll take my lateral scale, and I want to pull it right up the center of that shell back and tie it down with a few turns. Make sure that's centered up. You can see that little strip of flash there. Now, the reason I tied my mono, uh, my mono rib in on the far side is if I had tied it in on my near side, when I'd go to wrap it, it would lift the, the near edge of that thin skin. And what I, what I want it to do is not lift the, the near edge. So I'm going to come around the bottom here and... Make my first turn just in front of the tail. And I'm pulling hard on this as I'm making these rib sections. Just nice, evenly spaced turns. But I'm pulling real hard on this to sink that mono down 
into the dubbing and thin skin. And I'll tie that mono off with a few turns. You can see that gives us a nicely segmented abdomen. I actually bumped my hook a little bit there because uh, I was pulling so hard. Now I can cut everything off here. And what I want to save is that piece of thin skin, that stub of that thin skin. So I'm going to save that off here to the side. Now I'm going to take another little pinch of that same dubbing. And in this case, I'm just going to build a ball just in the conventional manner. I'll just twist this on. And I want to build this ball sort of overlapping the front edge of the abdomen. And I say ball, but it's just a, a little section of dubbing. And then for the legs, we're going to use a, a grizzly hen saddle, um, dyed gold. And I'm going to take a, a nice big grizzly feather here. Get a hold of a good one. Ooh. Like so. And I'm going to strip all that fluff off the bottom. And what I'll do here, get this down here where you can see it. So I'm going to pull out a clump at a right angle to the stem. And it's not always exactly a right angle, but about a right angle till their tips become even. And I'll grab a hold of that clump and pull the rest of the feather away. And then just sort of roll that up into a little bundle, like you might, might make a tail. Um, now I'm going to measure this for the legs. This is going to be about a half shank long. And I'm going to put my far side in first. So I'll lay this on the far side and catch it with a few turns of thread. Right on the far side of the hook. Now, you can see that I, what I stripped off that feather, it was even on both sides. Now I'm going to take the other side of that feather to the same point and pull that clump out so that they're at a right angle and peel those off. So now I've got two clumps that are exactly the right amount uh, or exactly the same amount. That doesn't necessarily mean they're the right amount. That just means they're the same amount. So I'll measure this against the first set of legs, lay this in along my near side, and catch it with the Turner, Turner 5, like so. Um, I feel like this near side's just a little longer. You can see how I just pulled those butt ends to shorten those legs down a bit. Now I'll lift those butt ends up and trim those out. Smooth that off a bit. And now I'm gonna take that remaining piece of thin skin that we've got here, and I wanna make sure that the end of it is cut square and we're going to tie in what's called a free wing case. Um, and Barr's the first guy that, I know this has been around a long time, but the first guy that I saw do this with synthetic materials. Um, but we're just going to take that square cut piece and overlap it just about to the middle, midpoint on the hook. I'm going to lay it flat on top of the hook and come with a soft loop over it. This is a great example of a soft loop. You can see how that thread is, is slack right there. I'm going to bring that thread around the thin skin and then tighten toward me. And that'll buckle that thin skin so that it shapes down around the top of the hook. So it's just a flat little wing case there. And I'll anchor that down in place and then trim it out. Um, and typically with thin skin, because you've got a rounded surface, you've got to make two cuts uh, to get a good clean cut without a lot of bulk there. I'll smooth that off a bit. And now we're going to do that same process one more time. Um, like I said, this fly seems complicated. It's just got, just got multiple steps, like a lot of flies. Um, they're not hard. They're just involved. Um, so I'm going to put another little pinch of dubbing on here. And I'm going to dub up to the base of that first wing case. And you can see my dubbing comes right up to the bead, but there is a little tiny bit of space in, in there. We're going to do the same thing with that hen feather. I'm going to pull off a clump, pull it out so it's about even. i got to get it where I can see it here. Pull that off, measure that against the first clump, um, and again, I'll, I always do this on the far side. I want to be a little cautious because that bead was sharp, um, but I'll sort of measure those, and you can see they're about the same length. Now I'll do my near side. Same maneuver, same amount of fibers. I ain't showing you this time because I've already shown you three times. You should have it by now. Come on. All right, so I'm going to measure this. I'm going to tie this in on my near side. I'll get a hold of it here. I'm trying to keep my fingers out of your out of your way. Yeah, about like so. Now I can come in and trim these stub ends out.
very carefully. I don't want to get the legs that I just tied in. And I'm not really worried too much about getting a super clean trim on that because we're, we're going to have a chance to cover that. You know, I'm all for details, but um, don't fight the ones that you can, that end up being hidden. So now I'm going to take that same leftover piece of thin skin and I'm going to overlap it about halfway up the first wing case and press it in place on top and do that same soft loop and tighten it down right behind the beat. Make a few turns there to get it anchored in place. So we've got stacked wing cases now. Now this leftover piece is right up against the back of the beat, so I'm going to pull it up tight. And I'm going to cut up across the center and then down. And that's going to keep me from having a big stub that sticks out on the back of the bead. Um, again, we're going to have some some chance to cover that, but but uh, if you just cut that straight across, you're going to have long edges uh, that will show, and that's that's four to four to seven percent less fish um, in my experience. Uh, but you do you do what you want, man. All right, now another little fine thin strand of dubbing, very small this time. Um, we're just going to dub the collar here behind the bead just to cover up that thread work, and you can sort of use this these turns to. Maneuver those legs, and then I'll end with the bare thread just behind the bead. And I'll come in and whip finish, and just let that slide off the back side. And tuck that whip finish in under the bead. I'll come in and nip my thread out of there. Get a few, few crazies. And that is John Barr's Tungstone. Um, this is a really good fly. I fish this fly a lot. Um, and a size 8 is not uh, not too big, really, as I hold this in my hand. This is a um, you know squarely medium-sized golden stone. This is not even a big golden stone. Um, but really a, a pretty effective pattern. I think owing to that it's uh, got a couple different colors on it. So it's got the dark top, um, dark dorsal surface, um, but it's got that much lighter belly. So when this fly tum tumbles through the water, the fish get a a few different flashes of different colors, which is very similar to what the real stonefly presents um, as he drifts downstream. Um, but this is a good heavy little fly. Um, really, you know, not much more involved than a hare's ear or no additional tying skills from a hare's ear. Um, you already know how to do this. You've probably done all these things before. Um, just put them together in a different order, which is how you tie flies. Um, but at any rate, um, that's, that's one from my old friend John Barr. Um, still one of the coolest guys I've ever met. And uh, maybe maybe the most innovative tire ever, um, but yeah, that's I like to just look at that thing on the screen, and just kind of go back and forth. Um, simple fly, um, not a lot of complications, nothing on there that doesn't need to be. Um, yeah, that's the essence of John Barr flies. Um, anyway, that's a tongue stone. Thanks for watching. I'm Charlie Craven. Um, I'll twist something up here in the next few minutes. I just got to clean my desk off. So um, I'll be back with more. Like and subscribe. Don't forget that. Yeah. Uh, all right, you guys. Have a good day. Take care.